A universe of sound, turning astronomical data into soundscapes. How do we perceive the invisible universe? We cannot see X-ray light. We cannot see radio light or infrared light directly with human vision. We have to think of ways to represent those parts of the universe that humans can't see. Astronomy is often presented visually. We need to reach users who are blind or low vision. Astronomy has always been a huge interest of mine, and as a blind person, it's challenging to learn about it and to experience it in the ways that people normally do. We can work with data using sound. Our ears are extremely adept at picking up out of a noisy background a sound of interest, low signal to noise data, whether that be a conversation on the other side of a room, or whether that be a blip in a data stream. We are all part of the universe. We've been trying to approach this multimodal representation of our universe that people can participate in no matter what the context is. And the universe is part of us. These different approaches give a different representative experience of data that is so esoteric. Hi, my name is Dr. Kim Arkens, and I am a visualization scientist for NASA's Chandrax Observatory at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Russo. I run a project called System Sounds, and I'm a musician and an astrophysicist. Today, we're going to listen to a sonification that I'm a huge fan of. It's over at the Galactic Center. And what we've been doing is creating sonifications that really make sense for this high energy data that's coming from the Chandrax Observatory. So with this image, this is actually a composite of three images. So it's optical light taken by Hubble, infrared light taken by Spitzer, and X-ray light captured by Chandra. And they're all combined to this one image. So to listen to this, we scanned across the image from left to right. And we let the light from the top of the image produce higher pitched musical notes so that it's, it's listenable. <laughs> and so we separated it into the fuzzy kind of nebula, which makes a kind of soft droney sound and then the more point-like stars or um, any kind of compact source of light which produce notes. And those notes we played on different instruments depending on which telescope captured that data. So Hubble we represented as strings, plop strings, uh, Spitzer as piano, and Chandra as a glockenspiel. What's really beautiful about this sonification that as you're panning across from the left to the right of the data set, you're going to hear as you approach that far right side this really tremendous crescendo where there's just all of this sound happening, lots of beeps and boops and other high energy sounds. And what it's signifying to you is that this is the downtown of our Milky Way galaxy. This is a very highly energetic region around the very area of that supermassive black hole that's lurking underneath all of that gas and dust. And all of that sound, all of that energy comes across so well in that little crescendo. And you can hear it not only in this ensemble piece with all three of the observatories mapped to all three of those instruments, but you can also hear it individually as solos as well. So you can learn to pick apart the sort of individual constituents of what makes this, this little mini symphony work so beautifully. Yeah, and you can listen to the fact that different telescopes are sensitive to different structures and different shapes. And so the optical light, for instance, is, is kind of confined to these arc type shapes, which you can hear. And the infrared is much more spread out because it's, it's, it's being emitted by spread out gas clouds. And the X-rays are have a lot of uh, a very intense X-ray sources from you know, very massive bright stars. And those are all, as Kim said, huddled close around the galactic core. Exactly. So you can really differentiate those complex and compact structures to those longer stringy filaments that are played out in the softer tones to that really high-pitched stuff that's coming across from the exploding stars and from the area around the black hole. And it all fits together to make this one really beautiful ensemble. It's not a song, but it's an auditory piece using musical notes and instrumentation. And the experience is really hard to put into words, as would be looking at the night sky. And the Chandra Deep Field South? It looks like just a black square with a bunch of multicolored dots. But when you take the energy levels of each of those dots, those X-ray sources, you find that you're listening to a deep 
rich field of thousands of black holes. Verified by scientists and students who are blind or low vision. For me, it was visceral and aesthetically pleasing, and I was getting information. Curiosity should be all that is needed for anyone to explore the cosmos. The Perseus black hole sonification is sort of unlike any other that we had done before. Astronomers discovered back in 2003 that pressure waves were being sent out by this supermassive black hole at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster. And that black hole was sort of belching out, uh, causing these ripples in the galaxy cluster's hot gas. And through a little bit of math, that could actually be translated into a note, into a sound, but one that is really hard to hear. So one that humans can't hear because it's about 57 octaves below middle C. That's like hundreds of keyboard keys further south than what we can hear. But this new soundification of that Perseus galaxy cluster sort of brings those notes um, of that black hole sound up into human hearing. There is a very popular misconception that there is no sound in space. And I think that originates with the fact that most of space is indeed essentially a vacuum, where there is no medium, um, no, no atmosphere, no gas for sound waves to propagate, to travel through to you, a listener, right? But a galaxy cluster has huge amounts of hot gas that envelop the hundreds or even the thousands of galaxies residing within it. So that provides a medium for pressure waves, for sound waves to be able to travel. So in this sonification of Perseus, those sound waves that astronomers had previously identified through a special imaging technique, they were extracted and then made audible for the first time almost, you know, 20 years later after the original scientific story came out. And then those sound waves, they were extracted in these radial directions, so kind of outwards from the center. And the signals were then resynthesized into what humans can hear. So we had to scale them back up by about 57 and 58 octaves above their true pitch. So another way to think of this is that they're being heard about 144 quadrillion and 288 quadrillion times higher than their original frequency, which is pretty amazing. So that sort of radar-like scan around the image that you're hearing, you're hearing the waves emitted in different directions. And this was a really exciting result, but also seemed to capture the imagination of the public in a way that we just hadn't anticipated. This result went hugely viral with like 1,200 different news articles and stories on it, with those potential metrics reaching as many as two billion listeners. All of the response to it, it was overwhelming. It was incredibly exciting to just see that really excited response from people, the bringing into the conversation of things like x-rays from Chandra and hot gas in a galaxy cluster. It was a pretty cool experience. We can read about astronomy and then we can experience it with our senses and sighted people can look up at the sky and have that moment. That's what the sonifications were like for me. Space is boundless. Let us make sure that access to it is the same. Our spacecraft is equipped with an amazing sonification machine. This device turns light into sound. For most of our tour, we will use different musical instruments to represent the light from different objects in space. Audio Universe is all about turning the universe into sound, turning astronomy data into sound and representing space concepts with sound. We do this for three main reasons. Firstly, to explore our data, our astronomy data, in different ways and hopefully make new scientific discoveries using sound. Secondly, to make immersive and 
multi-sensory educational experiences, and finally and importantly, to make the universe more accessible to everybody, in particular people who are blind or have low vision and can't access astronomy using traditional visual methods, they can explore the universe and enjoy the universe with sound. For this project, we've been working with many external partners, including musicians, science centres, including the Great North Museum, and also community groups of blind and low vision people, and finally schools, in particular schools that have special support units for vision impaired children. And it's been extremely useful and rewarding for us to work with these partners as we try to tailor what we're doing to our target audience, and that's been a very enriching process. I acted as a consultant on the project along with one of our students who is a completely blind young man um, just to make sure that things were accessible, that the sounds that the astronomers were using were saying the right things and actually our student Amrit Singh um, did keep people on track and said when it didn't work and said when it did work and it was an incredibly rewarding experience for him and for me to have that collaboration with the universities and to enable one of our students to, to come off the kind of mainstream path of learning, to have that collaboration was fantastic. Now it is time to leave the earth. We will take off and study our planet from above. Hold tight, here we go. One of the things we have done is create a show for blind and low vision people where we represent all of the objects in the solar system with sound. And the feedback we've had from our low vision audiences has been fantastic. They said for the first time they've been able to understand and appreciate what's out there in the night sky. And for those who lost their vision later in life, some of them have said to us they felt they could reconnect with their joy and appreciation of space that they had as a child. The fifth planet from the sun is Saturn. Let's use a euphonium sound. For the first time, um, children with a visual impairment who are taught in mainstreams, their learning isn't an add-on to the mainstream lesson. It is a fully inclusive environment that everybody works alongside each other. As we move forward, we're trying to make this idea of turning data and representing things with sound more mainstream, all the way from schools and as an educational way to be more inclusive, right through to the cutting edge research. So our current focus is developing research tools where you can download the astronomical data straight from the telescope, turn that through into sound, hopefully make new scientific discoveries, and all through that process we're aiming to make the whole learning process and research process more accessible to everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Scott Fleming. I'm from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland in the United States. And I'm here to talk to you today about our project called Astronify. First, a little bit about the Institute, which is also known as STSCI for short. Uh, we are the operations center for the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes, as well as the upcoming Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope set to launch later this decade. It's also the home of the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes, or MAST, which supports more than 20 different missions, the earliest of which goes back to the 1970s. And uh, we have primarily uh, space-based telescopes that operate in the ultraviolet, optical, and infrared. The archive houses several petabytes of data. Most of our data is comprised of images, spectra, time series in the form of light curves, and catalogs of a wide range of sizes. 
Our Astronify team uh, is consists of myself as well as a few other folks listed here. Claire Brasur, who's a developer at the University of St. Andrews currently. Jen Kotler, who's the designer at Space Telescope. Kate Meredith, who's our education and outreach specialist from Glass Education. And Jenny Medina, the newest member uh, who's a developer at Space Telescope as well. And the purpose of our project is to create an open source Python software package that primarily is intended for sonifying for research and analysis purposes. Uh, it's designed to be used for one dimensional data, so things like spectra or light curves. And in our project, we choose to use tones instead of musical notes. Um, we chose this because we thought it uh, would avoid some other contexts that can be associated with music itself and allows the sonifications to focus on what the data is doing, um, which unlike other sonifications that might have interests in producing sonifications for education, outreach, art, uh, media, um, our, our software is primarily intended for, for use um, for research purposes. Um, each data value gets a tone that has a duration that sets how long the tone plays and an interval for how fast we play each tone or each data point. And the parameters of the sonification, like the pitch frequencies, how it scales, the different values between min and max pitches and volumes, the duration of the notes are all configurable from the software. So I just want to play a couple of simple examples to get you an idea of how Astronify works. Here's an example I'm going to play, it's a short clip. And uh, you don't see the data points here, but the line traces the data in these plots. And for this first one, uh, we're just going to play data that's not changing whatsoever. And you'll hear a tone that doesn't change in pitch. All right. The next example is going to show what the sonification would sound like of the top of a triangle. And so you all will be able to see or, or remember how the um, top of a triangle feels or looks, and you can imagine what the sonification would sound like. So you can hear the pitch rise and fall as the shape itself rises and falls. Um, in Astronify, the default configuration is to create sonifications so that when a value increases, whether it's brightness or any other parameter, the tone of the pitch will increase. And likewise, when a uh, value drops, the pitch drops, but this can be changed in the software. Finally, the last simple example will be the top of a circle, which as a shape has a more gradual change, a smoother change, and you should hear that in the sound as well. These are simple examples, but you can tell how uh, by listening to the changes of these pitches, you can get a sense of what this one dimensional data is doing. I want to now show uh, just a few, uh, a couple of quick examples using some real data from the Kepler Space Telescope, which is one of the missions that MASS supports. There's lots and lots of options, but I'm just going to choose one example here. Um, a light curve, as a reminder, is a measure of how the brightness of an object changes over time. And traditionally, you know, what people will normally do when we're uh, visually analyzing the data is to make either a line graph or a scatter plot um, and on the Y axis or the vertical dimension plot the brightness values and on the X axis or the horizontal dimension, uh, we will plot the time. Um, and so instead we are taking these data sets and applying sonification to them. Um, there's lots and lots of reasons why a star might change in brightness based on what the physics are happening uh, in that system. And there are um, lots of different sonifications you get out. There are tons of different sounds based on the types of physics happening. But for this short uh, presentation, I'm just going to focus on a relatively simple example, which is what happens to a star's brightness when an object, like a planet, crosses between our line of sight and the distant star it's orbiting. When that happens, the planet literally blocks some of the light coming from the star it's orbiting, much like a person would block a part of the screen if they walk across a projector. And when this happens, the brightness of the star dips a small amount, but it is measurable with precise telescopes like Kepler, and that's what we're here showing here now. So here's a, some real example of some real data. 
and you can listen as the brightness of this star, which is changing for other reasons on the star itself, will occasionally have some big dips in brightness that you should be able to hear by a deep drop in pitch. So you should have heard three instances where for a small amount of time, the pitch of the sonification drops significantly, which is when the planet is crossing in front of the star and blocking light. This sonification is gonna be uh, slightly more zoomed in on one of those events where we can get some more detail, both by zooming in on the data we're plotting and also on the sonification. So here we'll start off at a base level flux and then we will be watching in more detail the shape of what's happening as the planet goes uh, across the face of its star. Here's what this looks like, it sounds like. So in the middle of the sonification, you should have heard a period of time where the pitch was much lower than originally, and that's when the planet is crossing in front of the star. And there's very, very short amounts of time when the pitch is changing, and that's when parts of the planet are starting to cross the face and then starting to uh, leave the face of the star. And by analyzing these shapes, we can actually measure some properties of the exoplanet and the star itself. Similarly, by listening to the shapes, you can get a sense of, um, uh, listening to the sonifications, you can get a sense of what the shape is and make some conclusions as well. So what's next for Astronify? Um, our software is open source. It is in version 1.0 and it does support uh, space telescopes like Kepler and TESS. Um, our next big step we are working on is to create what we call preview sonifications for spectra coming from the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes. Similar to preview thumbnails that are often used on websites to give uh, snap judgments of sort of, hey, is this data quality good or bad? Or if you have a little bit of uh, knowledge about the types of data you're looking at, you can usually get a sense of what type of object um, this is by uh, doing a quick uh, visual inspection of, of, the, of the plot, um, we want to create short uh, preview sonifications that can do that same analysis, quick, quick informative sort of analysis um, in sound, and then add those preview sonifications directly into our archive's primary search interface um, alongside the visual versions of the previews. Um, and broadly speaking, our team's primary goal is to provide sonification options for researchers as part of their day-to-day -day work as professionals and to make sure you know, our unique uh, role we can play is that we are the archive for so much data um, collected over so many decades uh, now and in the future that we can really um, provide sonifications for uh, increasing accessibility for professionals or students and also for any researcher who wants to be able to add another dimensionality to their research and analysis. So you can find everything you need about Astronify on our website, which is astronify.readthedocs.io. You can get the GitHub link uh, to the software. You can get access to our tutorials, which are in screen reader accessible HTML formats. And you can also find a variety of videos, podcasts we've done. Um, and also, uh, if you ever want to get in touch with me, please go ahead and email me. It's my last name, Fleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G, at stsci.edu. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to you trying Astronify in the future. Welcome to Accessible Astronomy Image Analysis for the Blind via Sonification. I'm Tim Spuck from AUI, and I'm joined by Yasmin Catracheo from AUI and Jim Hammerman from Turk. We are here to talk about the iData project, Innovators Developing Accessible Tools for Astronomy, um, which work with middle and high school students to learn about computational thinking in astronomy while developing designing and developing authentic software to allow blind and visually impaired students to do astronomy data collection and analysis. There were also curricular resources in English and Spanish, but we're gonna focus on the software. 
Thank you. I data and it was possible thanks to the collaboration of different partners and institutions across the United States and also one in Chile. Um, IATA was funded by the National uh, Science Foundation under the program STEM Plus C. Uh, the funds was for $2.5 million. Um, this is a picture of a barred spiral galaxy, but even though astronomy is often thought of as a visual field, it really is not. The data that we look at come from multiple wavelengths that mostly we can't see with our eyes. So including infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray data. Um, but what we get are data. There are data arrays. Um, and if you zoom in on that picture, uh, you'll see that there are pixels that have values. And we can either choose to display them as visual images, but if we can't see, or if we want to explore other ways of understanding the data, we can do something different, like sonifying the data. Thanks, Jim. And so the technique that we're using is pretty simple. If you can imagine that there's a piano keyboard along the bottom of an image, that would mean that the low tones would be on the left and the high tones would be on the right. And if you can envision that we scan each pixel row uh, from the bottom through the top and each pixel row is a new strike of the piano keyboard, you can see that we'll get a mix of low tones and high tones. Uh, which tell you whether you're on the left side of the image or the right side of the image. If it happens early in the scan, then you will have, it, it will be in the bottom of the image. If it happens late in the scan, it will be in the top of the image. And of course, volume is um, linked to brightness. So the brighter an object is, the louder it will be. And here's an example of what we're talking about. These are three fake stars. So you heard the low tone, you heard the mid tone, and you heard the high tone late in the scan. So let's take a look at an, a, a regular astronomical image. Let's start off by listening to this when you can't see anything, but if we listen to the sonified data array, So you can hear lots of different tones, but you can tell that there were a lot more sources toward the middle of the scan rather than at the beginning or at the end. And so this is what actually the data array looks like to us. And if we want to hear it again. Okay, let's try it. Let's Let's try that once more. So what can we do with this and, and what have we done? Um, one of the powerful things is that anybody with a web browser has free access to this software. Um, you can upload your own data arrays and sonify them, or you can use the Skynet Robotic Telescope Network to take pictures of objects in the sky and, and listen to them that way. Um, because we have the tool available, blind and visually impaired learners can work alongside their, their sighted peers to do basic astronomy image analysis. Um, and the software, as well as some teacher training, is available in English and Spanish, and we're doing that work in both the US and in Chile. So what, is, what are the next steps for IDATA? Um, first of all, we're working on an educator workshop that is gonna go around in the United States. For those uh, educator workshop, we will work closely with those communities to identify how they can approach the IDATA in the best way possible. We also are looking for a 3 million grant uh, for the future to continue developing and doing research perception now about half after glasses sonificated Imagines. Uh, we're exploring how we can use now afterglow access that is ready and how we can use it now in another areas of science and exploration as a geospatial data and explore impact of data analysis to multi senses as well. 
How can I get access? Uh, this is very simple. You can just go to the website and that is uh, here on the presentation. You don't need to have nothing installed on your computer. Just uh, um, if you have um, a email, Gmail address, you just get into the system and you will be able to use Afterglow access and, and go look at the pictures and make the sonification of them. So we invite you all, please go to the website, visit Afterglow, uh, Afterglow Access and learn more about astronomy through MAM sonification. <laughs>
the same source data of the same transit, but now we try to fit the data with the sound. This is not sonifying a fitted line. This is trying to extract the medium value of all the sounds by using different techniques. In this case, a kind of solar wind effect sound is produced. From this first example of the sonification of a transit, we can extract two ideas. In the second rendition of the sonification, the solar wind effect, we created a new procedure to work in the sound dimension. It's working directly on the sound data. It's mimicking a fit to the data. The second idea is that we can create two very different soundscapes using the same input data. In the first case, the individual sound events, we reproduce kind of a robotic language sound, which is very friendly and easy to hear, in particular for the young audience. In the second case, the solar wind effect, the soundscape is darker, deeper, more prone to be liked by an adult audience. We have tested these examples and it's indeed the case that this stellar wind effect rendition of the same data tends to frighten the young audience, especially if the room is dark. Thus, we can create two different soundscapes and to produce different emotions on the audience. The second example is a more advanced case, both for its astrophysical background and the complexity of the audio. This example sonifies the Herzsprung Russell diagram, one of the most important tools in the study of stellar evolution. It plots the temperature of stars against their luminosity. In the vertical axis, the y axis represents the luminosity, while the horizontal axis represents the temperature. Mind that in this case, the axis is inverted, so the hotter stars are positioned on the left side, while the cooler stars are positioned to the right. Depending on its initial mass and second order on its metallicity, every star goes through specific evolutionary stages dictated by its internal structure. Each of these stages corresponds to a change in the temperature and luminosity of the star, which can be seen to move to different regions on the HR diagram as it evolves. In this example, we sonify the evolution of a 20 solar mass star. The luminosity is mapped by the frequency, so higher frequency stands for higher luminosity, while the temperature is mapped by the vibrato. The vibrato is a fact consistent of a regular pulsating change of pitch. So, the higher the rate of the vibrato, the higher the temperature of the star, while a lower rate of the vibrato represents a cooler star. The evolution in time, the passing of time, is represented by the sound of a bell. Stellar evolution. Star of 20.0 solar masses. Luminosity is frequency. Temperature is vibrato. Time steps of one million year. Sonification by Cosmonic Project In this stellar evolution sonification, besides having different parameters like the temperature, the luminosity, the time, we use different approaches for the sonification. For example, the parametric mapping for two of the variables, but also auditory icons and ear cones to represent the pass of the time and also one of the final stages, which is the explosion into a supernova. We have tested that this combination of the frequency, 
the vibrato and the explosion and the end tends to amuse to the young audience, tends to make them laugh. So this unification produces another kind of emotion. In the web page and the YouTube channel of Cosmonic, you can find more examples. Please contact me if you have further questions. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, for this uh, meeting about inclusion. Uh, my talk uh, will be about sonification. Sono Uno is part of the development of um, Rainforce, the research infrastructure for citizens in Europe. And the idea is increasing the senses, increasing inclusion. Almost all that we know about the cosmos is um, outside the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And also we have information through the multi messengers. And this opened a new window to the study of the cosmos. And the proposal is to open a new one, uh, applying our multisensorial ability to study the cosmos. In this sense, uh, the new approach include, uh, includes the use of new resources, the evaluation of new tools with the help of the users, the inclusion of blind and deaf people in the groups of uh, research, and the study of the impact. Um, to do a better job, we propose to design first strategies, some objectives, challenges, design tasks, um, in the second uh, stage, uh, the implementation through the development in general, the deliverables and the training lessons, and finally evaluate the, the whole work um, through the feedback with the users, but also with surveys. Our motivation is, of course, the inclusion, understanding the inclusion as a real participation, um, the, the contact with the colleagues as equals, even in the disability. We can start using the, the normal or the very well-known resources like the tactile resources, some or part of these resources are in this slide, but also other things, other tools, like the sound. Uh, the use of the sound for us is a, a complement of the visualization, is um, part of the user-centered design from the beginning, with the final user inside the development. It is uh, an open source tool, a cross-platform, and a multiple device development. Uh, aims to eliminate the barriers presenting in general in, uh, in almost all the human activity and also improve the work with different styles of data exploration. As you can see, the design is modular. Different parts are mm, different uh, uh, ways of development with different people working on that. You can attack the different parts of the, of the software and the visualization is in is all together. Uh, we have um, a, a very nice website with all the information and the web and mobile interface interfaces. Um, in the website, you can uh, reach from the man the manual and the um, uh, installation uh, tutorial until the source code the GitHub uh, address and the contact to the developer. Um, in the web interface, there are several things you can explore. Uh, you can deploy the plot, the graphical interface, the sound interface, mathematical functions, and um, you have uh, available shortcuts, collapsible panels, and also a sample of uh, data you can use for training and um, an input section to enter your own data. Um, 
there are several possibilities to change in the case of the plots, the titles or the grid options. And in the case of the sum, the frequency, the volume and the tempo. I invite you to go to Sono Uno web interface. Here we are inside. And if we go to home, you can see the, the graphical interface. You can enter some, for example, data, data set, the sample of data sets, and you can see the, the spectrum. This is a galaxy spectrum with emission lines, and you can transform this data into As you can detect, all the mission lines are detected by the, the, the software. And if you want, you can save the sound, the markers, if you mark different characteristics or the plot. Also, you can input some the data set from your own laptop. And here, for example, is a, a sinusoidal wave. You can stop, pause, mark if you want this point, and you can save all the data in the in the deployment. If we come back to our our original presentation, here we have a, a combination of Sono Uno with other devices. Here is the light sound. As you can see, the light sound is a, a is a, a specific uh, device to transform the sun of the, the sunlight into sound, and you can use the data from this device with Sono Uno and produce, for example, this kind of uh, of output is the light of the eclipse. These ticks are persons crossing in front of the of the device. You can detect how the sun is covered by the moon and the light of the sun is decreasing until a minimum when you are in the uh, a total solar eclipse. This can be used for different things for training courses, workshops, specific and special activities, and of course, art and science connections. Sono Uno is using for education and also with the real data, scientific data. Here are cosmic rays from the um, Pierre Observatory in South America and a short sound uh, with cosmic rays. These peaks are high energy cosmic rays. We can also can sonorize images. Here are um, uh, glitches for, um, uh, from the ego in the left side uh, glitch uh, and a specific glitch, uh, very fast uh, noise called blip. And on the right, um, scattered light. And you can hear here, for example, the sound. The sound, we are sonorizing the image. In this slide, you can see the plot of the glitch, the 3D printer um, tool, and the sonification. The final proposal for sonification using Sono Uno is to have a platform, a Sono Uno as a service platform in which the user, researchers, artists, citizens can obtain the result of the sonification directly from the Sono Uno server, which transform the data into sound. 
The future of sonification is a, a very impressive future. Here in the image, you can see the first discovery of the variable stars with, with uh, Sono Uno by blind students. This was an amazing moment, uh, past May 17th of this year. Well, about the future of sonification, we our our goal is to uh, obtain some recognition of the multisensorial exploration as a valid study of the data, increase the ability to identify signatures in the information using the the sound, adding this uh, capability to the images and bring people with disability to the field and increase the amount of scientific discoveries. Uh, what about the open science accepting things? Well, we, we are talking about different data exploration styles and more perspectives and more experiences. As a conclusion, we can see here in this image, we love this image. Uh, what about the e equality, igualdad in Spanish? Well, is to provide the same tool. What about equity? Is provide a tool to permit the access everyone to the data, to the nature, to the observation, to the discovery. But the real inclusion is when the barriers has been removed. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Enrique Perez Montero. I am a scientist researcher in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía, a research center of the Spanish National Research Council in Granada. Uh, my field of research is devoted to the study of Star Wars galaxies. And I am doing this task, even though I am totally blind at this moment, I have lost my sight owing to a degenerative disease of the retina called retinitis pigmentosa. So at this stage, I have to move with a cane and I have a guide dog as well. Uh, today, I would like to present all the activities I am doing in my outreach project using sounds in order to uh, take astronomy to everybody, including blind and visually impaired people like myself. Collaborators and partners. Astraccessible or Astraccessible is the product of the, of the work of many other people, including people in my own institute, my family, and other researchers in other centers who have helped me during the last years. And uh, financial support uh, and logistic support of many organisms, including FESIC, my, my own center, and as well uh, ONFE, which is the Spanish National Association for Blind People. Web and Facebook. You can find many of the activities and the, and the different uh, aspects that we cover, uh, inspecting our web page and the Facebook channel. I have to say that uh, so far we are focusing above all in, in for the Spanish community in, in Spanish, but I think that our activities can be extended to many other sites and peoples and, and communities, of course. Objectives and activities. Our activities began when I started to give some uh, uh, workshops and conferences to other blind people in centers in the ONCE, trying to design and share all the resources we, we were using, including uh, touching materials and uh, uh, descriptive texts and sounds as well. And very soon we learned that these were very effective when they were used not just for blind people, but for everyone. Um, uh, making people that they get uh, knowledge using other channels make the uh, knowledge, uh, the learning process much more efficient. And I have tried to um, make publicity of this new strategy to other scientists and uh, people devoted to our reach in the last years. Use of sounds. Of course, the use of sounds is very valuable in this schema because sounds make information very uh, inclusive to people who cannot see like myself. Even though in the last two years when uh, owing to the pandemic situation, most of the presential activities were not allowed, but 
as well as sounds uh, uh, used at the same time with other uh, sensorial channels like uh, sight uh, make more complete the comprehension that we have of the information because sounds uh, have more a better uh, time resolution uh, it covers in the, with the human hearing a uh, larger range of frequencies and uh, attracts more the information to everyone uh, in particular uh, when we are translating information to sounds, people is able to judge more efficiently the, but the best way to access to the information because most of people know that sound cannot travel uh, across the space. So they can wonder to what extent these are the best way to represent the information. But they do not do the same with other kind of visible lights, such as, for instance, in this image of the Milky Way in X-rays, um, it's, it's the best way as well or not. Anyway, for most of the activities, it's important to understand very well the context in which sounds are used because sounds are not self-explanatory most of the times. A visit to Mars. Among the different experiences I would like to comment and different examples of sound we have used is this one. This is an inclusive visit to a desert, desert of Tavernas, in the southeast of Spain. This place is thought to be an analog of the planet Mars. So this visit for blind people using models of Mars and the use as well of this sonification, which is signal uh, noise uh, taken by the mission inside of NASA in the listening planetia, uh, makes it easier to people to think about the very low dense atmosphere of the planet Mars. Painting with sounds with Cosmonic. This is another example of our philosophy, the Cosmonic project, led by Ruben Garcia Benito. I really invite you to see his video as well, because the philosophy of Cosmonic is painting plots with sounds. We are not renouncing to the use of plots in images, and we really think that the, the, the simultaneous use of sounds and plots, uh, on one hand, makes people uh, with uh, um, an, an importance to access to data, and on the other hand, people who has, is able to see and hear at the same time, they can much better comprehend the, the, the content of what we want to transmit. An example of this is the sonification, uh, representing how quick uh, uh, stars uh, rotate around the center of a spiral galaxy. We do know now that this velocity does not decrease when the radius enhance, and this could be an evidence of the presence of a dark matter halo in this galaxy, this kind of galaxy. Articles with sounds. The use of sound in articles and different uh, contents for web pages uh, makes clear the content of this article along with the use of, of, of figures at the same time. This is an example of an article about the solar activity written by our collaborator Irene Abril, which sounds, sounds uh, made with the Astronify uh, script of Python, in which we can appreciate with sounds how the number of sunspots vary with time, and it is easier, easy to recognize that a period of 11 years appears in this variation of the solar activity. Support to the models, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Of course, uh, when we are using touching material, the simultaneous use of sound with material when blind people is able to recognize using sound when they are touching makes easier the recognition of these patterns. Uh, of course, this uh, philosophy at the same time is, uh, it can be used as well for all kinds of people that are able to touch, uh, hear, and see at the same time. In this case, we are uh, showing uh, a, a sheet with a representation in 3D of the spiral galaxy that we can complement with this very wonderful certification of the uh, radial distribution of the different bands in the Whirlpool galaxy made by the Universe of Sound with page of the, of the Chand Observatory. Support to the models, the Crab Nebula. This can be made even for more complex uh, models, such as, for instance, this one, which represents the constellations of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, hemisphere. Uh, for instance, the Taurus constellation, one of these horns, we can find the Crab Nebula, which is a very uh, beautiful 
uh, uh, supernova remnant. It's very uh, recognizable. And, but this uh, gas is illuminated by a, a central neutron stars, uh, which is rotating, which is very hot. And it's easier to recognize because this is a pulsar with a very constant uh, radio emission with a very constant period, which is uh, very easy to solidify and hence to recognize as a pulsar. Citizen science. Another example we are collaborating with is citizen science. This is an example of a project made in collaboration with the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. They have developed an, an app, a mobile app uh, which uh, uh, can be used by people to try to identify and classify meteors using sounds. The radio emission taken by Rodar near Madrid is converting to sounds and people can collaborate to the project trying to uh, uh, classify the meteors according with, with the sound they are doing that. Of course, this is a very important project because it allows blind people to participate, which is just, uh, a real novelty in, in relation to other projects of citizen science. Okay. The universe in words. I would like to finish this very brief presentation. Uh, I tried your attention with a project uh, based on, on the description, which is called the universe in words, the universe in palabras. And the description is quite important because uh, it allows uh, blind people to uh, get access to the visual information and at the same time allows to people who can see the image to interpret and to know what they are seeing. Uh, at the moment, we have released 15 videos uh, made in YouTube, all of them made in, in Spanish. Uh, they represent objects of the Messier catalog, but represent as well some objects which are, can be touched in different models, so they, this, this material can be used in different kinds of activities. An example, the Eagle Nebula. These are released, as I have just said, in YouTube, all in Spanish, but as an example for this presentation, I have adapted one of them using a, a synthetic voice uh, to, 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 to perceive how well does it work when we, 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 we try to recognize this, this object, in this case, the Eagle Nebula. The figure has a diagonal orientation. The head of the eagle, that apparently looks towards the right, is orientated towards the upper right corner. It has rounded shape and, interrupted by small dark clouds, presents a phantasmagoric aspect. Its large wings, joined over the head, spread over both sides, towards upper left and lower right corners, respectively. Thank you. To finish, I would like to thank every people who is uh, releasing sounds to make astronomy more accessible because it helps to people like me. But I really think that this material helps as well to everyone because they allow people to approach astronomy in a different way and they can understand much better what we scientists try to explain to them. So please continue this effort and, and make like people happier uh, thinking about how our universe is. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Russo, astrophysicist and musician and director of System Sounds. System Sounds is a science art outreach project created to share the wonders of the cosmos through sound. After completing my degrees in jazz guitar and astrophysics, I was struggling to decide on a career path between those two options. And luckily in 2017, they discovered the Trappist-1 solar system, which is the most musical solar system ever found. So I realized I could combine my two passions by converting astronomical data into music and sound. I teamed up with another astrophysicist, Dan, and another musician, Andrew, and we began our sonic exploration of the cosmos. We started by producing sonification videos of solar systems, Saturn's rings, Jupiter's moons, and this eventually led to a TED talk, and then recently to creating a musical night sky for Ringo Starr himself. We use a wide spectrum of sonification styles and techniques, ranging from very direct translations, like converting a light signal into sound, all the way to more artistic versions where we're mapping features of an image into music. In all cases, we strive to balance communicating the scientific content with creating an interesting and effective aesthetic experience. 
We've also produced public exhibits, such as a sound-based planetarium show and a 12-hour night sky sonification under a large planetarium dome we built from scratch. We've now produced dozens of sonifications for different NASA agencies, including an ongoing series of image sonifications with the Chandra X-ray Center. These are among their most popular content. And recently we completed a user survey of 4,500 participants, and they found, we found that sighted and blind participants reported equal amounts of enjoyment, of perceived learning, of increased curiosity, um, with our sonifications, and they also helped sighted people understand how people who are blind access information differently. So that was a huge success. Here's an example of an image sonification we did for the James Webb Space Telescope team of the Cosmic Cliffs. Uh, this will scan the image from left to right, and it will map the height in the image to pitch. So light near the top of the image is higher pitch than light near the bottom of the image. And brighter light is louder, and we also use different techniques for the red nebula on the bottom, the blue nebula on the top, and the stars themselves to make them more, uh, more distinct sonically. One of our collaborators on this project was Christine Malik, who is a blind musician and astronomy enthusiast. And she said that when I first heard the sonification, it struck me in a visceral, emotional way that I imagine sighted people experience when they look up at the night sky. Um, so this is one of the, the most important feedback we've ever gotten. And here's an example of a sonification we did for NASA. This converts the discoveries of exoplanets over time into music. So as time progresses, you'll hear a note for every exoplanet we've discovered and the visuals will show you where on the sky it was found. And the pitch of the note indicates the orbital period of the planet. So planets with very short orbits um, are higher pitched. And our most popular sonification to date is the sonification of sound waves in the Perseus galaxy cluster. Uh, the image here shows ripples, which are actually very, very low frequency sound waves propagating through the gas. And we extracted their waveform from the image so that we can reconstruct a sound with similar sonic qualities. And then we sweep around the image to sample that tone in different directions. So this was featured in over 1200 articles, including the New York Times, and that gives an estimated audience of 2 billion people. So people found this a very fascinating sonification and hopefully it, it inspired them to learn more about black holes and sound in space. But by far the, the most rewarding part of this whole project has been uh, meeting and interacting with people who are blind or visually impaired. And as one blind listener said, listening to sonifications before I go to bed makes me feel more connected to the universe and less alone. And so this is a big part of why we do what we do. Thank you very much. Martin Archer. I'm a Stephen Hawking Fellow in Space Physics at Imperial College London in the UK and I'm going to talk about how myself and my collaborators have been listening to the magnetosphere. In particular we study magnetospheric ultra low frequency or ULF waves. Uh, when it comes to plasmas, the space plasmas around our planet, uh, these waves are the analogues of sound waves. You can see an animation just here, which shows the particles and their associated magnetic fields moving in a very similar way to sound waves, and we call them magnetosonic waves. They also have uh, a kind of sister sort of wave known as the Althane wave, which is kind of like um, a wave on a string. Now, in the magnetospheric space environment, 
these both of these sorts of waves can bounce around that space environment forming resonances and these occur at millihertz frequency so incredibly low um, and we can think of our magnetosphere as a giant magnetic musical instrument and one which is actually very important for space weather which is why we study it and the way we actually do that studying is usually through satellites that provide in situ measurements of the perturbations associated with these waves, which we then see as time series measurements. And so that really lends itself to the use of sound because human hearing has lots of benefits over standard kind of visual analysis or even some basic computational analysis. And so the simplest thing that we might want to do is just a direct audification of those oscillatory sound waves. So taking that, um, that data, speeding it up so that the frequencies we're talking about fall within the audible range and then just listening to it. And so some precursors to the project we're currently working on did exactly that for waves in geostationary orbits. And we were sharing these with school students throughout London and one group of students acting as citizen scientists found this. Completely unexpected waves that turned out followed a solar storm hitting our magnetosphere and triggering what's called a geomagnetic storm. Um, so seems like sonification or audification gives a great way of really hearing what the data actually sounds like when you transpose it into the audible regime. However, this method does have some problems. For certain orbits, uh, certain missions, it can make these waves pass by so quickly. What you just heard was five days worth of data. Here's three days worth of idealized data from a different satellite in a different orbit. Everything just happens way too quickly. So it made us think, is there a way that we can tackle this to make these waves applied to any satellite uh, as audible as possible, as good as possible when to listen to, without tinkering with the underlying data, without kind of messing with it too much. And it turns out there are methods that have been already been developed for audio and music, um, which are time stretching. So we want to extend the amount of time that the audio takes without changing the frequencies or the pitch in the audio, because we've already got that right. And so we applied these methods. Um, we tried out a load of different combinations. And rather than just a, a small group of space scientists picking what we thought was the best, we thought it was better to actually conduct a survey of experts and stakeholders and ask them what do they think is the best. So we did that last year. And you can see the results on the right hand side. So we picked out the method that we should choose, the amount of time stretching that we should use, quite how we should normalize the volume, etc. And now we have these recommendations on how best to make these magnetospheric ULF waves audible. And um, so we go from the clip you just heard, the idealized example, uh, now becomes this. So you can hear that that takes much more time, it's much more perceptible, but that is the idealized version. Let's pass our same process through some actual real data. If you want to know more exactly how it works, have a look at our study. You can even use our software as well to make your own sounds. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing this is that we want to run kind of really wide citizen science um, using this technique. So we have the HARP project, Heliophysics Audified Resonances in Plasmas, um, which we have been uh, beta testing for about the last year, year and a half with high school students and undergraduate students in the US. Uh, we're coming up to the point where we're ready for our first campaign, which will be Hear the HARP, so listen out for those sweeping tones that you heard in those two examples. And you can see on the right hand side, the graphical user interface that we've built up to help citizen scientists actually be able to pick out exactly where they hear the harp. Uh, we're gonna be ready for a public release of this in early 2023, and we're already planning what we want to do next. Thank you.
I would like to describe my method of sonification, which employs user design centered methods and skeomorphism to design sonifications for a variety of astronomical data. My name is Michael Quinton, and I'm a sound designer and a musician. My main areas of research are sonification and astronomy, and the study of the way that sound affects people's perception. I have also done work in the field of soundscape studies in relation to urban and environmental planning. And I have recently been working on a research project concerning virtual reality and live music performance. My design method consists of integrating the end user into the design process and the use of skeomorphism to represent real life aspects of the data. Interviews with end users and paying attention to the words that they use to describe the data gives indications of the associations that they make in relation to the data. These descriptions are the key elements that should be integrated into the sonification design. Skeomorphism is a design concept where objects are made to resemble real world counterparts. By using this technique, in sonification design for astronomy and replicating the behavior of that object, it is easier for the user to understand the sonification. The trick is to use aspects of human hearing as tools to mimic these real life behaviors. So here are some examples of sonification design that I created using the techniques that I have just described. An end user had described planet Earth as being full of life and imagine the sound of water. These descriptions were integrated into the sound design and the sonification for planet Earth sounded like this. The rings of Saturn are the most distinct characteristics of this planet, and the end user described the rings as sounding like a record playing. Parameter mapping sonification is the most effective method that allows the sound designer to use psychoacoustic elements of hearing to represent real life phenomena. In the table displayed on the screen, one can see the interrelationship between the different psychoacoustic qualities in representing a real life object. For example, proximity can be identified through loudness, changes in pitch, changes in timbral qualities of the sound object, and spatial perception shows whether the object is coming from the right, left, center, back left, back right, center back, above or below. So let's give some examples here. The first model built uh, was of the solar system where eight of the planets were sonified and represented on a surround sound system. The planet's size, its distance from the sun, orbit speeds, qualities of matter, whether it was rock or gas, and a unique characteristic for each planet were created based on the descriptions given by the end user, who was the director of the planetarium. The model was tested with 12 people, 11 people from the general public, and including the planetarium representative. Without any visual aid, the participants in the study were able to determine many of the planetary characteristics and the differences in size and orbit speeds between the various planets. They listen to the sonifications from a heliocentric position. Now here are some examples of the sonifications. This is the planet Jupiter.
And this is the planet Uranus. So this sonification was created to help an astronomer to identify traces of water vapour that were probably unnoticed when using visual graphs. Uh, this was a spectral data set which consisted of water vapour signal and noise. The astronomer described the water vapour like flowing water and the noise like white noise. These aspects were integrated into the sonification design. Water vapour was spatially separated from the noise, placing the water vapour on the left, left ear, noise on the right. When water vapour increased in intensity, it moved from left to right ear, and the peaks were emphasised by adding harmonics of the third, fifth, seventh and eighth. This was added to the signal and it proceeded along the stereo field. The noise moved from right to left ear as it became more intense. The astronomer was immediately able to detect an aspect of water vapour previously unnoticed when using visual graphs. The water vapour was spotted around two to three microns and was immediately identifiable. Let's have a listen to the sonification. <laughs> An astronomer wanted to be able to classify various accretion disks orbiting around various stars by using sound. The data consisted of dips in the light of the star observed over periods of 77 days. The astronomer described the accretion disks as sounding like giant sandstorms. The dips were higher in pitch and the sonification was listened to both on surround sound to hear the disk orbiting the astronomer and in stereo. The astronomer was able to classify various accretion disks and to identify anomalies between systems which could possibly indicate the formation of planets, though this could not be confirmed. Using surround sound, he was able to notice differences in the speeds of the disks, which could indicate the distance of the accretion disk from the parent star. This characteristic could not be identified by using visual data and was only noticed using sonification. Here are some examples of accretion disks. In this sonification, the astronomer wanted to find out whether a planet was orbiting in the midst of an asteroid belt by sonifying asteroid collisions. Dips in light represented the various asteroids passing in front of the star. The exosolar system could be observed as having a warped asteroid belt, which is the result of asteroid collisions, which are mathematically calculated according to the warp in the belt. The data represented 33,000 days of observation. The astronomer had described the asteroid collision sounding like breaking ice. Peaks were emphasized using pitch, higher pitch for the peaks. And again, both surround sound and stereo sound were used to represent the sonification spatially. The sound designer made sure that the sonification was given ice breaking qualities. The astronomer was able to immediately detect the planet moving within the midst of the belt just by listening to the collisions. And here is the sonification of the asteroid collisions. <laughs> For future work, I would like to be able to apply sonification to other aspects of astronomy. I'd like to create a more effective and robust sound generation engine to be used uh, with the diverse astronomical data sets. I would also like to work on a multi-sensorial data analysis tool that uses extended reality sonification and haptic feedback. I'd also like to carry out further interviews and listening tests to form a vocabulary that can be used in general sonification design. 
So thank you for your attention. And if you'd like to contact me for further questions or research collaborations, then please feel free to reach out to me through the email shown below or by phone. Uh, my number's just over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Giorgio Presti and I'm virtually here to present a sonification of the Zeta Cosmos Galaxy dataset. In this presentation, I will provide a very brief description of the dataset we sonified. Then I'll focus on the design of that proposed sonification. And finally, I'll briefly discuss the outcome. Ok, let's start. The astronomical data we wanted to sonify are those coming from the Zeta Cosmos Galaxy dataset that is the result of an international effort aimed at studying the galaxy's evolution in the last 10 million years. It has been obtained by the VLT-ESO telescope in Chile, pointed on a relatively small portion of the sky. The dataset includes data from more than 18,000 galaxies. In particular, for each galaxy, available variables are their position in the sky, their mass, their brightness, their star's formation rate, that is the number of new stars generated per year, or a measure of how active the galaxy is, and their redshift, that is a proxy for the last variable, the age of the universe at the observed distance. We wanted to use this data to achieve three goals. First, we wanted to provide a sound-based description of the dataset in order to provide a different perspective on the data. Then we wanted to hybridize science and art in order to bring complex scientific data into people's everyday life. And finally, we wanted to enhance the Zeta Cosmos dataset itself, to consider it as a cultural heritage, as a human effort that deserves to be celebrated and preserved. To achieve these goals, we built a procedural system that let us explore different configuration and sonification lengths. We used only ecological sound metaphors, that means we tried to map each galaxy variable to adequate sound parameters, linking, for example, brightness with volume, and so on. We also wanted to sonify the uncertainty of the observation and we wanted the sonification to match the aesthetics of contemporary electronic music. The final sonification is a 25 minute long artificial soundscape composed of three main elements. A layer where each galaxy is sonified as a single acoustic event, modulated by the variables present in the dataset. A second layer where galaxies with extreme values are marked with the auditory icons and a third layer playing a polyphonic drone sound modulated by the moving average of galaxy variables across time. Before describing the exact mapping between variables and sound parameters, it must be said that to ease the interface with the sonification module, we normalize the variables between 0 and 1, clipping the outliers in order to maintain a good resolution. The clipped values were marked and sonified in a separate layer. Now, each sound event of the galaxy layer represents a galaxy and the time it took course, it's linked to the age variable. The wall sonification is like a journey that starts from Earth and goes farther away, back in time. The pitch of the sound is linked to the galaxy mass. Smaller galaxies will produce a high-pitched sound, while massive galaxies will produce a deeper sound. Galaxy brightness is linked to the volume of the sound event. Brighter galaxies will produce a higher volume sound. Star formation rate is linked both to the length of the sound and its frequency modulation parameters. Less active galaxies will produce short, slowly modulated sounds, while very active galaxies will produce a longer and richer sound. Finally, the position in the sky is linked to the position in the stereophonic space. Galaxies on the left will be heard more on the left speaker, while galaxies on the right will be heard more on the right. The outliers of mass, brightness and star formation rate are marked with symbolic sound. In particular, the ones you are going to hear are the sounds for low and high mass respectively.
This is the one for high brightness. Low brightness is not marked since the lower cut is arbitrary. And these are the sounds for low or high star formation rate, that is, inactive versus very active galaxies. The statistical layer is composed of three drone sound, each realized by filtering white noise with a narrow band bandpass filter. The frequency of the filters is controlled by the moving average of mass, brightness and star formation rate variables. To render the idea of increasing uncertainty, the quality of the filter is inversely proportional to the elapsed time, so as to suggest that the farther we look, the less we know. At the beginning of the sonification, drone sounds are almost sinusoidal, while at the end they consist in a wide band noise. Finally, some post-production have been made in order to balance the level between the three layers and to apply some pleasant reverberation effect that is the listening of the composition. Now I will let you hear a small excerpt of the sonification. Thanks to the choice to diverge from tonal harmony rules, rather focusing on the best possible rendering of the original data, this sonification challenges the listener by proposing uncommon musical structures, typical of contemporary music. Such a listening activity is expected to raise users' awareness about their own perception and highlight the importance of sound as a carrier of meaning. Public presentation of this sonification already started to take place as dissemination events in cultural institutions and planetariums, and as art installation in museums. We hope you have enjoyed the work and thanks for watching. My name is Adrian Garcia River. 
I'm a PhD student from the Music and Technology program of the Polytechnic University and the Royal Conservatory of Madrid. My research is focused on sonification of astronomical data and the use of deep learning techniques applied to music and astronomy. My thesis is aimed at expanding the use of astronomical data in music for STEM outreach and public engagement with science, exploring the use of deep learning in sonification applied to astronomy and astrophysics, finding case studies in which multimodal representations could be useful for our research, and enhancing the accessibility of astronomical catalogs and databases. Working over a basic pipeline that converts feeds files into OSC messages and MIDI scores, all the sonification prototypes use a Python kernel to hold the calculations and a free and open software as sound engines. This example show the automatic multimodal exploration of a Stellar Stellar library from the Spanish Virtual Observatory in a time versus flux to frequency conversion. Another research line of this project is focused on the sonification of analysis variables such as the periodograms used to search for periodicity in light curves. This music sheet explores sequentially the light cues of Kepler exoplanet object of interest catalog from the Space Telescope Science Institute archive. The mapping uses a best period to node period conversion with periodogram power controlling node dynamics and mean periodogram power controlling node durations. Here we can see another prototype synthesizing best fit periods to flute nodes. The next multi channel sonification prototype explores test missions DBT files from the Space Telescope Science Institute archive. The duration and depth of the transits drive respectively the duration and amplitude of the significations, offering a spectral music inspired representation. This is an example of the single target version of the prototype for the auditory exploration of TIC 55652896 adding virtual observatory tools like Aladdin widget, Pivo, and Sidbat Witcher and Mass queries. The graphics are also calculated in real time to show the folded light curve, transit model, and a start plot for each object of the catalog. Trained with almost 1,000 stellar spectra from the Miles Stellar Library of the Spanish Virtual Observatory, here we can see the results of a 12 dimensions variational autoencoder latent space sonification for one of its OVA FJKM star types. We have also developed an unsupervised composition system to create a final score by cross-matching the stellar tops generated with a variational autoencoder that explodes the Miles Stellar Spectral Library with the tops generated by a LSTM with attention neural network trained over 1000 scores of the Renaissance composer Giovanni Pierrini La Palestrina. Finally, we are exploring the possibilities of sonification in the analysis of absorption and emission lines in the spectroscopic libraries.
you can visit the auditory virtual observatory Vimeo channel, where latest designs are uploaded, or send us an email for any question, feedback, or suggestion. Thank you. Hello. The title of my talk today is Sounds of Space, an Art-Science Collaboration. I'd like to begin by thanking my collaborators, Kim Cunio, a leading Australian composer and head of music at the Australian National University, and Diana Scarborough, a multimedia artist from Cambridge, UK. Our planet naturally produces a wide variety of radio emissions. And these radio waves are generated by two principal processes, lightning activity during thunderstorms and geomagnetic storms, ultimately driven by the sun. These radio transmissions are at the lower end of the radio spectrum, typically in the range between 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz. And they can be best detected by large antennae, either in space or on the ground. The frequency range of the human ear extends over three orders of magnitude, ranging from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Earth's naturally occurring radio signals lie within this audio frequency range. Now, sound waves are vibrations of air molecules, but these emissions are a form of electromagnetic radiation and they cannot be heard directly. However, the recorded emissions can be converted to audio files and play back as sound, revealing a series of weird and wonderful noises. Now Halley Research Station, operated by the British Antarctic Survey, is a fantastic location to record the sounds of space as it is magnetically connected to the outer radiation belt where some of the radio waves are generated. It is also electromagnetically quiet, being far from human society. The Halley VLF receiver consists of two orthogonal 58 meter squared single loop antennae and it is specifically designed to detect the magnetic fluctuations of the Earth's low frequency radio waves. The weak signals it detects are amplified, processed electronically and subsequently digitized at 96 kilohertz. The VLF ELF data from Halley are used primarily to investigate the science of space weather storms, to help understand space weather impacts on the Earth's climate system, and for lightning detection as part of a worldwide lightning detection network. As a remarkable spin off, conversion to audio reveals a host of amazing sounds. The main signals a ground-based VLF receiver detects originate in lightning activity. Each lightning flash emits a short radio pulse, known as a spheric, which covers a wide range of frequencies. These are heard as short cracks and appear as vertical lines in a spectrogram. The spherics that we detect in the Antarctic typically come from the Amazon and Congo basins, both of which are over 8,000 kilometers away. So let's take a listen to some lightning spherics detected by the Halley VLF receiver. Some of the radio waves associated with lightning leave the atmosphere and leak out into near-Earth space. The signals may be guided by the Earth's magnetic field and received in the opposite hemisphere. They may even be reflected in the opposite hemisphere and detected in the same hemisphere as the original lightning strike. Higher frequency waves typically travel faster than lower frequency waves. The recorded waves have a characteristic descending tone and are known as whistlers. 
Pure note whistlers travel along a single field line or closely spaced group of field lines and are heard as a clear whistling sound. Another prominent signal type, known as chorus, is generated deep within the magnetosphere itself. Explosions on the sun cause bursts of charged particles of magnetic field that travel out into space. When they reach the Earth, they can tear open the magnetic field, causing a geomagnetic storm. During these storms, energetic electrons are injected into the Earth's inner magnetosphere. The electrons enter near midnight and drift around dawn to the day side and are restricted to the region outside the plasmasphere. The injection process leads to the formation of anisotropic electron distribution functions, which in turn excite plasma waves known as chorus. The most common form consists of a multitude of rising tones in the frequency range from 1 to 5 kHz. These emissions are known as chorus because they often resemble the twittering of birds in the dawn chorus. In 2017, we set up a multidisciplinary art-science collaboration to exploit these amazing natural sounds and make them more accessible to wider audiences. In 2018, we developed a show which was first performed at the Anglia Ruskin University as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. This show included a science talk followed by a performance with animations, soundscape, music and contemporary dance. A second show at Bass also featured live music from Kim and his son, Samurai. In a separate venture, the sounds of space from Halley were incorporated into an update of the space simulation video game Elite Dangerous in December 2018. In this collaboration, I work with Frontier Developments, the creator of Elite Dangerous, to incorporate the eerie sounds into the new gameplay. In any one of over 400 billion stellar systems, players can now use a new analysis mode to discover more about their surroundings. The new mode, called the Full Spectrum System Scanner, features the simulated sounds of radio emissions from exoplanets in remote stellar systems based on the Halley VLF recordings. In 2018, we started work on an album combining sounds from the VLF receiver at Halley with original music. For this project, we chose a particularly active 24 hour period to set to music. Kim went to work and matched the day of audio with piano music that he conceived of and played within another 24 hour period. The resulting album, Aurora Musicalis, was released in May 2020. It is partly a soundscape drawn from our most mysterious continent and partly a response to the natural radio sounds of our planet. It invites us to relax and enjoy the sounds of space set to ambient music on the grand piano. Our second album, Celestial Incantations, was released in June 2021. This album builds on the first album by introducing a whole new spectrum of space sounds, together with a huge musical palette, including orchestral instruments, traditional instruments and electronics. The album invites the listener to consider the vastness of space, imagining time and space in the grandest sense, and embark on a spectacular journey of sound. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Kate Meredith and I am the Director of Education at Glass Education in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. That's just a couple hours north of Chicago. Our mission as an organization is vast and varied. It covers a lot of areas of education and outreach for astronomy and STEM, but one of the areas we're best known for is our work in uh, advocacy and accessibility in the STEM fields for people, particularly with visual impairments, but any sensory disability. And our involvement with sonification started in 2018 with the Innovators Developing Accessible Tools for Astronomy project. Tim Spuck will be telling you about the tool that came out of that project called Afterglow Access. But Glass Education participated in the educational pieces of that and making sure that um, blind and visually impaired students teachers of the visually impaired and visually impaired astronomers had a voice in the development of that tool using a user-centered design process. And from that, after the IDATA project, we participated with um, Space Telescope Science Institute on the development of the Astronify project, where once again, our role really was to bring as many voices from the um, blind and visually impaired community into the development um, and testing of that product. So, as a result of those two um, uh, projects that we were involved in, we became really well aware of the fact that there are a lot of uh, sonification projects under development, and that not a lot of the groups were talking to each other, and that they um, uh, some of them lacked expertise in um, different areas, and in particularly representation by blind and visually impaired people in the development of the project. And we're really concerned about the fact that um, if you don't include people whose life experience has to do with uh, working with a sound and the people who um, use the science of sonification and need to inform the groups about um, making the tools themselves accessible and what is most useful to them, that we'd be losing out on a lot of expertise and we would come out with, once again, with products that weren't useful to the user community that they could benefit most. So as a result, I decided um, in February of 2020, because what else are you gonna do with the launch of COVID, let's start an online group called Sonification World Chat. Now, I never intended that group to last very long. I just thought we'd get a group of people together to talk about the different sonification projects that were going on worldwide. Well, that was, a, you know, almost three years ago now, and uh, that project continues to uh, attract more and more groups. And we present every month or two about what's uh, new in sonification and um, and spin off other user groups on the side. So we also have a learn group that um, is associated with the sonification world chat that um, continues to look at the educational end of teaching sonification, uh, just like we teach um, students how to read or how to interpret visual images. So. Uh, so we are the grand secretaries of trying to bring together the world to talk about sonification. So I strongly recommend that if you are a sonification project or interested in connecting with other sonification projects around the world, that you get a hold of us and uh, you can reach us at um, a Glass Education. And the person who's in charge of organizing that part of the project is Mari. And so reach out to Mari at glasseducation.org. That's M-A-I-R-E at glasseducation, that's glass with one S, dot org. And so you can learn about a lot of different projects, including the Audible Universe conference that will be happening uh, in December of uh, 2022 in, um, in the Netherlands. So uh, with that, um, enjoy and don't, um, don't hesitate to reach out for us to us. Uh, we are very interested in hearing from you. Mm -hmm.